welcome back. Let's check in with uh, Professor Richard Wolff, the economist, co-founder of Democracy at Work, author of numerous books, most recently, Capitalism's Crisis Deepens, Essays on the Global Economic Meltdown, his website, democracyatwork.info, and of course, R.D. Wolf with two Fs dot com. And uh, Professor Wolf, oh, and you can tweet him at Prof Wolf, P-R-O-F, as in Professor Wolf, W-O-L-F-F. -F. Professor Wolf, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Tom. Glad to be here. So we have had a wild ride in, since you and I last spoke, yeah. which I think was a week ago today, uh, right. as I recall, and uh, on the stock market. And uh, A, the stock market is not the economy, but B, the stock market has a hell of a lot of influence on the economy, as we all saw in 2007, 2008, or 2008, 2009, I guess. Uh, your, you know, what, what is going on here? What, what are your thoughts on this, and, and what do you see happening, and, and, and what do you think we should do about it, if anything? Well, um, it's, it's a little bit of uh, the old joke about deja vu all over again. Uh, let's remind everybody. Uh, we had a boom in the 1990s that ended up with the crash in the year 2000, what we call the dot-com crash. A panicked United States government rushed in to try to prevent that panic from becoming a depression, pumped up the money supply, dropped the interest rates, and we thought, wrongly, that we were out of the woods. We flooded the economy with money, the economy went crazy, and in 2008, collapsed again, only much worse than the one in 2000, the one in 2008 and nine. And what did the government do? Rushed in again, lots of money creation, driving down interest rates to historical uh, unprecedented levels. And we had a kind of a boom, at least in the stock market, to get it back and in corporate profits. But now, having pumped up the money supply in the last 20 years on a scale we have never come close to in American history, and with low interest rates having led, as many writers, including yourself, have pointed out, to unprecedented levels of individual debt, corporate debt, and government debt, everybody is on a kind of a knife edge who's an investor, looking at the economy and saying, this is not a sustainable situation, and anything that might make it harder for all the people, companies, and governments in debt, make it harder for them to pay off that debt, could precipitate God knows what. And so over the last few weeks, as exactly that has happened, interest rates are starting to go up because the government is borrowing even more because of the Republicans' tax cut, and around the world banks that bought up these government debts are now wanting to get rid of them because there's too much money floating around you have what economists call the perfect storm people very nervous debts very high fragile economic conditions and rising cost of debt you're going to panic people and what we've seen over the last three or four days is a panic and what people should understand is that even if we go through this one the normal procedure is to have several wild swings of the sort we've had the last four days uh, and then peace for a little bit and then they happen again and we all hold our breaths the bottom line here is this is an economic system that isn't working and the stopgap measures and the panic responses are actually making the problem of instability even worse. And God help the folks who need for their pensions to dip into a 401k or another pension plan at a time when the stock prices are down, then they will discover the real cost of having substituted um, defined contribution for the old defined benefit types of pension programs. We are really an economy on very thin ice. I remember back in the uh, in the mid 70s to the late 70s, I was running a business in Michigan, and uh, we had an ad agency and an herbal tea company. And the uh, the interest rates at that point in time were, as I recall. In fact, we bought a house back then, and I think it was 13% we were paying, if, if my recollection is right. Or maybe the mortgage was more like 11, but whatever. It was, it was double digits. And that didn't destroy the economy. 
Right now, uh, a, 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 an eighth of a point increase in, in the yield, you know, the, the yield that government bonds are paying, which is essentially, you know, the, the base of the, of the interest rate, um, shatters the stock market. Why is the stock market so sensitive slash vulnerable to, to interest rate increases now when it wasn't so, I mean, you know, there was the crash in 87, the Reagan crash, but there was no crash in the 70s when we were reacting to the Arab oil boycott, uh, air embargo. What's the difference between the economy then and now? Well, let me give you just two examples. I mean, the basic answer is a wild explosion of debt. You know, the, the Western economies, the United States, Western Europe, and I include Japan, although obviously that's in the East, the old success stories of capitalism, they have seen their industries, born and raised there, move in huge numbers to China and India and Brazil and places like that. And that means that the economic foundations of old capitalism is giving way to new capitalism. The problem is the mass of people, you, me, Americans, Europeans, uh, we don't want to face what that means to a for, to us, to a declining standard of living, becoming a secondary or marginal part of the world economy. And we've coped with that dilemma, not wanting to face it, by having our banks see a new profit opportunity to load us up with debt. Let's remember, back in the 1970s, most people didn't have a credit card in their wallet. They didn't have loans to send their kids to college. We didn't do that kind of thing. We are now awash in a level of debt that makes, as you put it, an eighth of a percent change in the interest rate really have deep meaning because we are all living, in a sense, on a falsely propped up economy, an economy that couldn't pay workers enough wages to buy what would sustain the economy. So we lent them the money to sustain the economy and ditto the government borrowing and ditto the corporate borrowing. And so we are now living with the consequences of that kind of a situation. Rising interest rates mean that the price of an automobile or a home or a college education is going to go up. And we don't live in an economic system that can cope with what that means when so many people have still not recovered from the last crash of 2008. They can't afford to buy things. They can't afford to borrow more because they can't carry it. You get a sense of the kind of chickens coming home to roost of an economic system that is in trouble, but coupling that trouble with a level of denial that really calls for a, a, a national attention to psychology more than economic. We have about 45 seconds left before we hit a hard break here. I, what do we do about this, and, and how do you see this deleveraging playing out? Well, my fear is that the deleveraging is going to produce volatility, as they like to call it, instability, which is the more honest term, or worse still, recessions and depressions, all amidst a long-term trend decline. What do we have to do about it? We have to stop pretending that we have an economic system that's wonderful and functions real well. The capitalism we have is good for the top 5 or 10%. For the rest of us, it isn't. That has to be faced, and at the core, that means reorganizing the economy. Yes, that's always scary. But as your question said, if we don't, we are in for scariness on top of scariness without solving the problem at the root. Wow. Serious stuff. Professor Wolf, it's always illuminating speaking with you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Tom, and look forward to it in the future. Me too. Professor Richard Wolf, economist, co-founder of Democracy at Work, democracyatwork.info. You can tweet him at Prof. Wolf and his latest book, Capitalism's Crisis Deep.